Welcome back to the Hardware Unboxed News Corner for your weekly dose of PC hardware news. Before we get into the main topics of this week, I just wanted to quickly talk about all the rumors and supposed leaks for NVIDIA's upcoming next-gen GPU lineup. I'm sure you've been seeing and hearing a lot of this stuff in the media, and it's only gonna get more silly as we approach the actual launch of these products. So we've made a specific decision not to really cover much of this stuff in News Corner, mostly for a few reasons. One is that there are so many conflicting stories. One minute a GPU is costing supposedly $2,000, the next minute it's $1,400, then it's something else. And then sometimes you'll see X clock speeds reported, next minute it's Y and then Z and so on. So yeah, the other thing is that it's basically impossible to verify this information outside of companies posting official documents like Micron did recently, and I'm sure a lot of you saw that news. So in these news roundups, you won't see us discussing the latest NVIDIA rumors because most of it is just pure garbage, and I'd rather just focus on stuff that is actual confirmed news or stuff that we can verify independently. I'm also just really not interested in spreading potentially false information. Like with our product testing and reviews, we want to make sure that you guys have accurate information to work with. And like a lot of rumor silly seasons, confirmed accurate information is generally not what you're getting. But I'm also interested to hear your thoughts in the comments below. Would you like to see us cover rumors surrounding next gen products or would you prefer us to stick to confirmed information? Anyway, let's get into the news topics. The first major topic from this week is AMD's announcement of the A520 chipset, which completes the 500 series of chipsets with offerings from top to bottom. We've had, of course, X570 for over a year now, and B550 has launched to market a bit more recently. A520 now sits below those two chipsets, offering an entry-level feature set for budget builds and systems. The major difference between the A520 range and B550 slash X570 is the shift from PCIe 4.0 support to offering just PCIe 3.0, and this is for all connectivity on the board. The PCIe lanes connected directly to the CPU are capped at just PCIe 3.0 on A520 for both graphics and the primary M.2 storage slot. B550, in contrast, offers PCIe 4.0 for direct CPU connections, so you get Gen 4 connectivity to the CPU and that primary storage device. For many users, having PCIe 3.0 will be totally sufficient, but it's still a step down from those higher end products and a way the board makers can save on costs. There are also cutbacks to the chipset side. AMD is still using a PCIe 3.0 times 4 link here, like with B550, but the features offered out of the chipset are different. A520 supports just one 10 gigabit per second USB port and two SATA 6 gigabit per second ports natively, compared to two 10 gigabit per second USB and four SATA ports on B550. There's also just four PCIe 3.0 lanes out of the chipset, versus eight with B550, although the optional connectivity features remain the same. So in total, an A520 motherboard can support either two SATA ports with six PCIe 3.0 lanes out of the chipset, or four SATA ports with four PCIe lanes. B550 supports either four SATA ports and 10 PCIe 3.0 lanes, or six SATA ports and eight PCIe lanes. So that's a big difference in connectivity with B550 supporting many more simultaneous devices. But still, for budget builds, there is plenty of connectivity available. For example, with this design, you could still have two PCIe 3.0 times four M.2 drives connected, one directly to the CPU and one through the chipset, as well as a full 16 lanes of GPU PCIe and four-sided devices. Of course, this configuration will depend on what the motherboard maker wants to do. Some of you might be wondering, well, how does this differ to A320, the chipset it's replacing? Well, the main difference is we're now getting PCIe 3.0 out of the chipset compared to PCIe 2.0 with the previous generation. In fact, all of AMD's prior 400 and 300 series motherboards only supported PCIe 2.0 from the chipset, including X470. This means that an A520 motherboard, as I mentioned, can support two PCIe 3.0 SSDs in total, compared to just one PCIe 3.0 SSD and one PCIe 2.0 SSD with older boards. It also means that A520 is not just a refresh of an older chipset, there is a difference and it is an improved feature set. The other difference is processor support. A520 will support Zen 3 like B550 and X570. B450 and X470 also support Zen 3 through a selective beta BIOS. 
Meanwhile, A320, the prior generation to these boards, does not support Zen 3 at all, or even Zen 2 for that matter. The trade-off here for BIOS space being that, like B550, there's no official support for first or second gen Ryzen CPUs or APUs. This is for third gen parts and newer. The last note here is on overclocking support. A520 does not support processor overclocking like A320. However, there is unlocked memory support, which is good news for a lot of buyers as often there is more to be gained with a Ryzen processor from tweaking memory than pure CPU overclocking. A520 boards are now available through various retailers, most of which are micro ATX and priced between 60 and 80 US dollars, although the best boards will be a bit more expensive. This essentially puts A520 around the mark of entry level B450 boards, sometimes a bit cheaper. Next story is another product that's now available. It's the Intel Core i9-10850K, a new entry into Intel's Comet Lake lineup that we talked about a few weeks ago. The launch of this part was a little strange as Intel just kind of snuck it out onto the market, but the news today is that you can buy one now from retailers like Newegg for 500 US dollars. This makes it a little bit cheaper than Intel's other Core i9 parts. The i9-10900KF and i9-10900K both typically retail for around $530, so the 10850K is 6% cheaper. This doesn't really shift the value equation significantly. In fact, if anything, the big selling point to the 10850K is that it's actually in stock right now, unlike Intel's higher end parts. And for most buyers interested in a 10900K, the 10850K will likely do the job just fine. The only difference is 100 megahertz lower clock speeds, so 3.6 gigahertz base and 5.2 gigahertz thermal velocity boost versus 3.7, 5.3 gigahertz with the 10900K. You're still getting 10 core and 20 threads and 20 megabytes of L3 cache, plus a functioning iGPU. It's also unlocked, so there is a chance that you could just overclock it up to the level of a 10900K. Why release this part at all? Well, we don't know for sure, but if I had to guess, Intel are probably producing a number of 10900K type CPUs that can hit the frequency requirements of a 10850K bin, but aren't quite good enough for the 10900K parts. 5.3 GHz is a very high clock speed to hit and not all parts can do that. So rather than throwing those away or selling them as something like a 10900, Intel releasing a 10850K allows them to still sell those CPUs for $500 and possibly improve the stock situation at the same time. Intel this week also officially announced their KA series processors, which are exactly the same as their existing parts, but with Marvel's Avengers special edition packaging. Intel calls this collector's edition packaging, which I think is a very generous way to describe it, but yeah, Avengers edition CPUs are now a thing. That said, no pricing or availability was announced. As spotted by Momomo on Twitter, while these Avengers edition CPUs look to be a tie-in with the upcoming game that launches on September 4th, these special edition Intel CPUs don't actually include a copy of the game, so the only special part about the CPU is the packaging. Bit of a disappointment to not even bundle in the game with the CPU, uh, something companies like AMD and Nvidia have been doing with products for years now. The Hot Chips 2020 conference was running all throughout this week, providing us with some interesting insights into upcoming chip technologies. As usual, for any deep insights into all the stuff happening during the show, I'd recommend checking out Anantex coverage. They have about a million live blogs on the event, but there are a few interesting things I wanted to pick out and discuss. The main one is the Xbox Series X SoC, which as we know, is an AMD APU with 8 Zen 2 CPU cores and a massive GPU based on next generation RDNA technology. For the first time at Hot Chips, Microsoft actually showed off an image of the SoC, showing the enormous GPU occupying most of the die space, along with two clusters of four Zen 2 cores each, plenty of GDDR6 controllers, a section for multimedia and hardware accelerators, along with a bunch of other elements. The full chip here is 360.4 square millimeters and packs 15.3 billion transistors, with the GPU appearing to use about half that die. The SoC block diagram Microsoft provided also shows how everything is interconnected, with both this GPU and the CPU attached to 20 GDDR6 channels through what Microsoft labels as a scalable data fabric. 
As for process node, Microsoft and AMD are using TSMC's N7e or 7 nanometer enhanced node. Microsoft lists the die as being more expensive than that used in the Xbox One X, although at a guess I'd say that's a launch pricing comparison. The other thing a lot of people have been interested in is the GPU design, which is giving a small insight into what we can expect with AMD's next gen RDNA architecture, specifically around how they have integrated ray tracing. Well, it looks like AMD are not using dedicated ray tracing cores like in NVIDIA's approach, but rather a split use design where the compute unit can either run texture or ray tracing operations in a given clock. It's really hard to make any further comments on this design without knowing how it performs, but it looks to be optimized for die space and cost, which are of course big considerations with the console. Microsoft did comment on ray tracing performance, saying the Xbox Series X is capable of 380 billion ray box calculations per second peak and 95 billion ray triangle calculations per second peak. Some people have tried to compare this to Nvidia's GigaRay numbers for Turing, but they really are not compatible metrics at all. The different design approaches with ray tracing cores versus split ray tracing texturing is also going to play into real world performance. Microsoft does say this design approach for ray tracing is to allow for hybrid rendering, traditional shading plus ray tracing like we've seen with current PC games, rather than a complete replacement. So that should be setting the performance expectations for RT on the Series X. There's a few other interesting notes in here as well, like HDMI 2.1 support, AVC and HEVC encoding and decoding. We'll be interested to see how many of these things transition over to AMD's RDNA 2 GPUs and what is specific to the Series X design. We'll just have to wait and see on that one. NVIDIA will be hosting their yearly GPU technology conference, or GTC, between October 5 and 9. At the start of the conference, CEO Jensen Huang will appear in a recorded keynote address at 6am Pacific Time on Monday, the 5th of October. The rest of the show will feature online sessions, both presentations and Q&A events, with a variety of programming so people in all regions can attend. This is mostly a developer-focused event with lots of talk on NVIDIA's key areas like graphics, AI, deep learning, autonomous machines, and all that sort of stuff, so don't expect big GPU announcements or anything like that, especially as NVIDIA are running a separate event in early September for that, but still, there could be some interesting announcements to come out of GTC. And final topic for this week, according to DRAM Exchange, demand for NAND is set to weaken significantly starting from the third quarter of 2020. While the research firm said says that SSDs have experienced a relatively smaller drop because there is still decent demand for these products, NAND flash wafers have suffered a noticeably larger decrease. This is due to an oversupply of NAND. Companies accumulated NAND inventory during the pandemic just in case there was some sort of issue with NAND supply, and with this excessive inventory continuing through this quarter, we're now in an oversupply situation. This has been compounded by weaker demand in some markets. DRAM Exchange predict this will lead to a 5-10% to drop in NAND pricing this quarter, with a 10-15% to drop in the fourth quarter of 2020. While it's not guaranteed to happen, this should lead to a fall in SSD prices over the rest of the year, which is good news for those wanting to build a PC using next generation parts towards the end of 2020. We'll see how this one plays out. That's it for this week's News Corner. As always, you can subscribe to get this segment in your inbox every week. We also have our Patreon page if you're interested in supporting the channel. Um, you'll get access to our Discord chat, monthly live streams, behind-the-scenes videos. In fact, there was a new behind-the-scenes video just published recently on our Patreon page, so be sure to check that out. Thanks for watching. That's it. I'll catch you in the next one.